Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Tom Bausch. I want to welcome everybody who's here in the sanctuary, as well as our uh, video audience. Glad to see all of you here this morning. I do have just a couple of things I want to share with you. Uh, the first one is that uh, we have a gentleman coming from Ogala um, next Sunday for our mission Sunday. Very excited about that. That's where Levi had taken all of the youth for the mission trip. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see what he has to say. That's next Sunday. And the other thing is we had our annual conference uh, yesterday, which was obviously different than normal annual conferences. If you don't know what annual conference is, in the Methodist Church, we're broken into different uh, geographic location locations. We're North and South Dakota, and we meet once a year, typically in Sioux Falls or Fargo, for two, three days, and we talk about the business of the church. We worship. We hear a guest speaker, and it's really a, a great time for uh, worship and great time for socializing. The business part not so fun. We condensed it all down into a six-hour our meeting yesterday, which was pretty much all business. So um, not the most exciting thing, but it's done. It's behind us. The only thing that came out of it of any significance, which really wasn't much, was um, our bishop has put together a what he's called a strategy team of about 12 people, uh, both on the conservative side and the progressive side, uh, to look at maybe ways we can work, uh, continue to work together after the uh, the denomination divides um, next year. So, other than that, it was pretty pretty exciting, wasn't it, Christy? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, and somebody reminded me it was opening of pheasant season too. So, yeah. Uh, well, I've talked to the bishop about that one. Um, so, Jen, you have an announcement, right? Okay. Good morning. I'm here on behalf of the Jam Kids this morning. Everyone has an invisible bucket that they carry around with them every day that needs to be filled. This was a quote from a very sweet little girl in our church. The Jam Kids have made buckets to hang on a board downstairs in Jam Central, and they're encouraged to write notes of encouragement to fill each other's buckets. We are so blessed to have Pastor Tom, Christy, and Levi here to encourage us. Pastor Tom spends hours preparing the words that God wants him to speak into our lives each week. He also is asked to make decisions for the church that will no doubt please some, but upset others. He's responsible for ministering to our congregation even during unprecedented times such as COVID-19. Christy is responsible for the hearts of the youngest through Sunday school to the oldest through pastoral care and all the ages in between. While part of her job is spent downstairs playing and having fun with the kids, there are many hours that go into planning and discerning what it is that God wants the message to the children to be. She's also asked to be with families that are walking through some of the most difficult seasons that God has for them to go through. Levi deals with the most vulnerable age groups in the church. What gets poured into our youth during their middle and high school years may determine the course of their faith journey for the rest of their lives. He's not only that person for the youth of our church, but for many youth in the community that find their way into the church on Wednesday nights. Their responsibilities will be much easier for them to achieve if they are not drawing water from a dry well. If we expect them to do these things for us and do them to the best of their abilities, we need to be encouraging them. Please write notes of encouragement for them. Let them know how much you appreciate what they do and the heart and soul that goes into each and every act. So with October being Pastor Appreciation Month, I want to encourage everybody to Fill their buckets. Tom, Christy, and Levi will each have a bucket with paper and pens, and you can write notes of encouragement to them so that we can fill their buckets. Thank you. I just have a couple more announcements um, from your bulletin. There are a couple of adult small group studies that will be starting soon. Uh, Yes. I just want to say one thing real quick about the small group study. One of them I'm leading is on the book of Revelation. And I just want to make it very clear. This is not your standard uh, study on the book of Revelation. We're not going to be talking about the seven trumpets and the horses and all of those kinds of things, okay? Uh, we're going to be looking at this from... Uh, 
what I personally believe is ways that we should have been looking at it for decades, which most people are coming on board with now. The way we've interpreted all the other books of the Bible is different than the way we've interpreted the book of Revelation. And so we're going to be looking at it from this other perspective and the way that we, we should be probably looking at it, interpreting it the way we've interpreted other scriptures. And so we're going to get to the meat and meaning and purpose the true purpose of the book of Revelation. So I encourage you, it's not going to be some crazy thought-provoking thing where you're going to have to know all the stuff about post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib, thousand-year reign, all that kind of stuff, okay? So if you're interested in hearing about what the meaning and purpose is for the book of Revelation, please sign up. The sign-up sheet's on the way out the door. Thanks. And that study is going to be starting on Tuesday, October 13th. Then there's also a study starting on Monday, October 19th, Finding I Am. All of that information is in your bulletin, as well as information about the gathering and the Central Book Club. Fall Festival will look a little bit different this year, so if you have young kids, uh, school-age kids, that information is in your bulletin as well. Now I ask that you stand and join us in our opening song, Step by Step. call to worship. Faith in Christ Jesus brings with it love for all God's people. Our faith and love are based on the hope offered to us by the good news we received from Jesus Christ. Let us not cease praying for one another and asking that we may be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that we may lead lives worthy of the Lord so that we may live lives with sincere faith. Come, let us worship God. Now please join me in our opening prayer. Ever-present God, we give you thanks for the revelation of yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ. When we grow weary of doing good, remind us that we are part of the body of Christ and that it is through us that his ministry is carried out here on earth. When we are impatient to see results for our labors, speak to us with reassurance that the harvest will come in your time and not ours. When we are gripped by worry, inspire us to be hopeful. Be with us now in our worship and may we feel your presence and hear you speak to each one of us. Amen. You may be seated. Please bow your heads in prayer. Holy and awesome God, there are many reasons to praise you this morning, and we lift all of those praises up to you. 
for those of us gathered in the sanctuary and for those of us listening or watching from home, we are blessed to know that your Holy Spirit is present with every single one of us. Lord, right now we lay all of our burdens at the altar and we ask that you fill us with your spirit so that we can pour out your goodness to everyone we meet. We continue to ask for recovery for Kim McRae and Darren Nitz from surgery, and we ask for complete healing for Kyler Thomas. There are many more unspoken requests, and we lift them up to you now. Even when it seems that you are silent, Lord, we know that you hear us. And now we join together and pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please stand and join us in our song of worship, Seek Ye First. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I see a couple of children here, so we're going to go ahead and do the children's message. And you young men can par participate too, if you'd like, back here. So, how do, does the grass get fed? How do trees get fed? How do wild flowers survive? How do they grow? Water? Yep, water's part of it. Yep, good answer. 
Sun, another good answer. Huh? Air, right? Those are all some basic things that plants and stuff need to grow, right? But where does all that stuff come from? In the last service, we had a young man who's very much a scientific intellect. He broke it right down to the molecule. He was amazing. I just blew my mind. I mean, he was teaching us all stuff that we were clueless about. But at the end of the day, all of it comes from God. The plants are cared for, the, the trees are cared for, the birds are cared for, everything in nature is cared for by God. And if God is willing to go to great lengths and create this wild processes and stuff to care for them, don't you think God's gonna take care of us and our needs? Right? Right. And that's what I want you to hear, is God will provide for your needs. If we're in God's will and we're growing as Christians, God's going to be right by your side. Okay? All right. That's all I have for you. All right. So let me ask the congregation. Actually, maybe I make it a statement. I don't know. I'll ask. Let's, let's go with the ask. How many of you in the last week have worried about something? Those of you who do not raise your hand up, I don't know if I believe you. We worry. It's in human nature to worry. You think about the world we live in today uh, specifically, right? We have a lot to be worrying about. And now I lost my notes. I'm worrying about where they went. And it's right in front of me. I just got to make sure the page numbers are correct here. We worry. And so because of this, God has really been putting it on my heart to speak about this idea of worry. And so we looked at it last Wednesday for God, and we had some great conversation about it. Um, it was my turn to do the Grant County Review article. So next week, you're going you're gonna to see that on worry. And I've taken some of the, the information from those two sources, and you'll hear about some of that um, in today's message. Uh, because I don't think we can speak to worry enough uh, during this this time um, in, in our lives. I would also say that um, I'm not going to be able to do enough justice to it because there's so much that could be spoken on the issue uh, of worry. So I hope you can gain something uh, from what I share with you this morning. So to start off with, with the message, uh, Gallup did a poll, a survey, and this was just back in March, the end of March, the first part of April. So it was only a couple weeks long. And uh, they, they described their findings as unprecedented increase in the number of Americans suffering from anxiety. They, they say that's a statistic that generally is pretty stable, increases just a little bit over time. But they said since last summer, the number of people feeling stressed has risen 14% and the number of feeling worried specifically grew 21%. And they attribute the COVID-19 virus to those numbers. Now that was back in March or April. I, I, I would be curious to see what those numbers are, are today. And, and when we worry, we, we know this, when we've worried, it's, it's almost like a, one of the least liked feelings we have, right? Because it can actually f cause this nauseated feeling in us, uh, an almost a physical sickness in us if we, if we worry too much about something because we feel a sense of insecurity and this unease and, and, and fear over something that we think may or may not happen that could be a very negative kind of thing. And as whether it's realistic or unrealistic, uh, these concerns may be, we, we have those. It's like I said, it's almost human nature. It's one of those most unpleasant emotions in human nature that, that we experience. Now, when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic specifically, the CDC actually says this. This is on their website. Things like social distancing can actually make people feel isolated and lonely and can increase stress, worry, and anxiety, which many, if not all of us, totally understand in our context, right? We get that. We know that. 
um, we're, we're experiencing it some ourselves. And I'm going to take this off since I'm way up here. Okay. The truth is that worry is, uh, is a major culprit, and, and I use that word with intention, right? It's a major culprit that, that causes not only, only um, um, this worry, but out of the worry we get clinical anxiety, uh, we get clinical depression, and we get all kinds of physical health issues that all come out of this. The CDC also says this. It says stress during an infectious disease outbreak can sometimes cause the following. Fear and worry about your own health and the health of your loved ones, your financial situation or job, or loss of support services you rely on, changes in sleeping or eating patterns, difficulty sleeping and concentrating, worsening of chronic health problems, worsening of mental health condition, increased use of tobacco, alcohol, and other substances. That's what stress can do during an infectious disease outbreak. There's no question many of you have been worrying. And there's a lot of things we worry about anyway. Sometimes we worry about how we look or the clothes we wear. Sometimes we can worry about the car we drive, the house we live in. A lot of those things, I think, have been shifting. Um, I don't know if people are worrying about those kinds of things as much as they have in the past. But here's the deal. Is there any one of us here this morning that's worried about your next meal? Probably not. Is anyone at risk of being thrown out of, of your home? Probably not. Are you worried about finding or having clothes to wear today? Probably not. One of the really fascinating things about worrying, uh, in my mind, is that things that we, that we really worry about, most of the time, a great majority of the time, never come about. They never happen. We worry about them and zip. Nada. We spend a lot of energy, a lot of time, worrying about issues that will never materialize. And I say this with confidence because I have research to support it. Penn State University, they, they did, a, did a study. And the participants were to write down their specific worries for 10 days whenever they noticed they were worrying. And then uh, the study uh, participants then had to review their list over a 30-day uh, uh, period and, and ask the question, did this come true? Yes or no. Did this come true? Yes or no. Did this come true? Yes or no. And in that study, what they discovered, are you ready? 91% of the things that we worry about never happen. 91%, that's huge. Uh, the other 9% that, that actually happened, the things we worried about that came, that came true, they weren't nearly as significant as what the participants thought it would be. And actually even 3% of that 9% of the participants said that they actually, it turned out even though it was a, not a good thing, it actually they learned and grew and gained something out of it. But 91% of our worries amount to diddly. In this morning's scripture, Jesus talks about worry. He's, he mentions the word six times. And as I've shared with you in the past, when we hear a word repeated over and over and over again, especially in a short passage like this, it's a major issue. There's, that's significant to what the author's trying, trying to get across. So obviously worry is a major issue that Jesus is trying to get across. And, and we hear this over and over. I want to just share a couple of, or three of those with you. In Matthew 6, 1, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. In 6.27, he says, Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And verse 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So you think Jesus wants us to be worrying? 
It doesn't sound like it, does it? He's very adamant that we, that we don't worry. And in this particular context, which applies to us uh, very much today, what he's really trying to do, he's trying to push people away from worrying about their essential needs to trusting in him and focusing in on the kingdom of God. That's, what, that's his goal. He's telling them they don't have to worry about those things. If they're focused in and trusting him and, and doing the kingdom work that he's calling us to do, he will take care of everything. He will take care of those essential needs of ours. The reality is, and you know, this kind of stings a little bit. Every time I read this passage, I feel the sting a little bit. Worrying actually shows a lack of trust in God. Right? And if anyone's going to follow Jesus, they need to make the kingdom of God a priority and be willing to trust God in all things. Said a different way, I would like this phrase better. If someone's going to follow Jesus, they should understand that an aspect of being his disciple means fully trusting him and letting the worry go, and by doing so, be freed from the worry, the anxiety, the fear, the burden that comes from that worry. Because that's what following Jesus and trusting Jesus can do. Augustine, uh, one of our early church fathers from around the fourth century, and you've, I'm going to share a quote of his, and you've probably heard something similar to this, but he's the, the original author of it. He's, he says this, he says, hard times, troubled times, these are what people are saying. Isn't that interesting? In the fourth century, he was saying that. We're saying the same kind of thing. He, he goes on to say, but let our lives be good and the times will be good. We make our times such as we are, such are the times. What he's saying is that it's a matter of perspective. There's an element to, to worry that is just that perspective. Human nature is to worry, no question. It, it, it's, it's part of almost uh, a built-in piece of us. And it comes out of our, our desire for self-preservation. We're all designed uh, for self-preservation. And that worry comes out of that self-preservation. And oftentimes, we consider worry as purely 100% a negative thing. But it's really about perspective. Because when we look at worry, we can see it as a negative or we can see it as a positive quality. In Jesus' day, what Jesus was talking to the people about, and again, it applies to us today, it was an issue of trust. They needed to trust that God would provide. They needed to commit to that. But they were too worried about those things that consumed them. But worry in of itself can be a very positive, have a very positive outcome. And when it comes to, to worry, we can really make a choice. We can either allow that worry to fester and, and develop into mental health, clinical mental health use, issues like anxiety and depression, or, or even contribute to or cause physical health issues. Or we have another option, I think it's a little bit better option. We can look at worry as a tool that, that can direct us to making good decisions, perhaps even come up with new creative ways of resolving issues. This is very true of the church. It's very true of us as individual Christians. The worry from the COVID-19 pandemic can either paralyze us or it can inspire us to do worship and ministry in new and exciting ways. I don't like being paralyzed myself, so I think I'm going to choose the, the latter. 
It can also move us to, to question our own personal priorities. I've heard many people speak about this already, how their priorities are changing because of this in good ways. There's also an element of, uh, of perspective that, that worry can bring with it that can actually ground us deeper in our faith and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Whenever we experience any kind of, of life-challenging event that causes us to worry, we, we can either get distracted and move away from our faith, which is not uncommon, right? In the midst of our trials, it's hard to see God in that, right? And it's easy to move away and, and not experience his presence, right? So we can also um, choose to view the worry as an opportunity to draw on the strength and the hope found in Jesus Christ. And by doing that, grow in our faith. You know what's amazing about worry too is it can actually be a, for some it may be gentle, for some it may be more than gentle, but you know, it can be a gentle nudge. Reminding us of one of the most important things for us to remember as Christians. And that is that this life is not the life. That our eternal lives are the life. Can I get an amen on that one? Thank you. The paper's really sticking together this morning. Uh, there's another observation uh, on the perspective uh, of worry, and we talked quite a bit about this on God, God Wednesday night, and that's, that's the issue of control. We, we really do deceive ourselves when we have the perspective that we are truly in control of our lives. When we have this perspective that, that, that we dictate and decide everything. In the video we watched on Wednesday night, uh, there's a man with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and he has given his testimony as a Christian man, given a wonderful testimony too. And he said a couple of things that are so true. The first is, I had to learn that I can't control the future. Now when I heard that, it kind of caught me off guard a little bit because oftentimes I find myself saying, or I hear other people say something to the effect of, you know, we really don't have control of our lives. But he changed it, he added that word future, and that made me think about all the different potential future things in my life. You know, I don't control who my children get married to, right? I don't choose um, what's going to happen uh, with Deb's job six years from now, right? The future, there's so much I, I haven't even begun to think about when the future. I think about, well, I can't control right now or tomorrow or the next day or the next week maybe, or I try and control them. <laughs> That's probably the truth. When you think about the future, it just opens up that box in my mind to everything and anything forever until I die. He also said, and he puts this, we can't control everything, really right down into a nutshell. And when he said this, he said, we cannot control squat. That's probably the best way to say it, because we can't control squat. Now, the reality is, we control about 3%. Studies have shown that we control about 3% of our lives. 97% we think we're in control of, but in reality, we're not. Now, I totally lost where I was at. Oh, here we go. Um, no, that's not here we go. Okay, so here's, here I got off track. So can, can, can we choose what to eat for supper? Yes. How many of you have already chosen what you're going to have for lunch today? Right? You've made that choice already. Some of you are going to go home, you're going to look in the cupboard, you're going to look at the fridge, and you're going to make a choice. Do I want that weak old meatloaf, or do I want a peanut butter and jelly? Some of you may jump all over that meatloaf. Um, I wouldn't, but anyway. Uh, but you have that choice, right? With the exception of my good friend Tom up here, how many of you dressed yourselves this morning? <laughs> right, right. Well, typically we dress ourselves. <laughs> 
typically we dress ourselves, right? We choose what we're going to wear when we get up, right? There are certain things that we can make choices about. Let me ask you this. Can you, can you control, control, control the COVID-19 virus? Can't, can you? What we can control is our perspective on the COVID-19 virus. We can control the worry that comes from the, from the COVID-19 virus. We can control our prayer lives and we can control our scripture reading lives. And if you want some assurance, if you want some encouragement, if you want some peace and contentment during this, if you're not doing it already, at least once a day, spend some time in prayer and reading your scripture. I, I, I can't guarantee it because I'm not God, but I'm pretty confident that over time doing this, you will experience some peace and contentment and some encouragement. And you're going to start seeing some of the anxiety and fear that comes from the worry going away. The reality is letting go of, of our claim to control and giving it to God, trusting God, frees us to being able to have that peace and contentment that God wants us to have. Let me suggest if you're going to do that, the, the scripture reading thing, I, which I strongly encourage you to do, why don't you start with this morning's scripture? Why don't you start with that? All right, the truth is, and we all know this, I'm not telling you anything new, we live in some extremely trying times. There's plenty for us to worry about today, let alone tomorrow or the next day. We also know that with worry, there can come anxiety, there can come depression, there can come fear close behind that worry. But the anxiety and fear doesn't have to catch up with us. If we use our worry as an opportunity, as a tool to be more a glass, not just half full, but perhaps even completely full. To use that as a way to grow closer in our relationship with God and those around us. We can also harness that, that, that worry and use it as a means to really grow deep, not only in relationship with, with one another, but again, in relationship with Jesus. I really think that this worry can be an excellent opportunity for, for all of us to bring us that peace and that contentment in our lives by recognizing the fact that we're not in control. All of this is really a matter of perspective. And it's really what I should have titled the sermon. Can I get an amen? All right, let's bow our heads. God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you so much for the lives you've given us. We like the lives you've given us for the most part. And um, Lord, we wouldn't, we for the most part probably wouldn't change a thing because you created us and you have blessed us and you provide for us and you give us hope and you give us encouragement and you desire nothing more than peace and contentment in our lives. And so Lord, we pray that we can take that worry and do a serious spin on it. So it's not something that draws us away from you, but instead draws us closer to you and those around us. Help us to continue to remember that, that this life is not the life, that our eternal lives are the, the life. And we uh, rejoice and we sing praises to you for offering that to us. Lord, bless each person here. Continue to give them the courage and the strength uh, to, to step out into that, that crazy world we live into and uh, be a beacon of hope to those around them. We pray all this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's take just a brief moment and uh, self-reflect on the, on the passage and the message.
Would you please stand and join in singing, My Life is in You, Lord? sure all of you that um, no matter what the trial is, whether it's COVID-19 or something else, I want to assure you that you can actually have peace and contentment during that trial. And I'm absolutely 100% convinced of this. And the reason I'm convinced of this is because when our daughter died, you know, I experienced that in the midst of the grief, that peace and contentment, as bizarre as it may sound. So I can tell you that you too can experience that peace and that contentment that God wants you to experience. Amen? Amen. See you next week.